Are you thinking about buying a house and this house has a concrete swimming pool? You should probably watch this video from beginning to end a couple of times. Let's get started. So this video is not a replacement for hiring a local professional to inspect the swimming pool. Like in addition to the home inspector, I mean a, a swimming pool professional specifically for the pool. I highly recommend that. Uh, take a look around. If there were four of them in your area and you're thinking about buying like a nice house, but it's got this older concrete pool, I would hire all four. I would not schedule them to come on the same day, but I would happily spend that money to discover as much as I could about this older concrete pool. And that brings me to my first point on the list here that I need to talk about. When you buy the wrong concrete pool, it can totally ruin you. And it's like for sure the, the origin for, you know, swimming pool nightmares because you can get into a snafu with old concrete pools and they can have such expensive problems that you don't know about. I love concrete pools and I endorse them to everybody who can afford to get them. But it's like, you know, you're buying a 1987 Lamborghini. It might have some problems, you know. In fact, has it been meticulously upkept? Because if it hasn't, you can pretty much expect you're going to have problems. And I'll get to that more in a second. But I, I just want to warn you without scaring you because it's not like fear mongering. If it's absolutely true, do not buy the wrong concrete pool or the wrong house, which has the wrong concrete pool. And I can't tell you how many times I've encountered a total disaster of a concrete pool and a, a homeowner who's reached the end of the rope and they don't know what to do and they just sell their house and just try to make it somebody else's problem, roll the dice that they won't figure it out in time or they won't bring it back and sue you or, or something like that. And a lot of the times with these old concrete pools, like you would be amazed to see how many leaks a pool has well, somebody can continue to run the pool and use the pool daily and claim to not even realize there's a problem, like shocking regularity. So when it comes to an old concrete pool, I want you to think long and hard about it. I want you to take every opportunity to not get yourself attached to the wrong pool by paying for extra professionals to come and look at it and all that. But this video here is a good precursor to all of that because you're not made of money. You can't just you know, have 10 professionals looking at every house you're considering to buy, this video is going to help you a great deal to be able to walk up to a concrete swimming pool, evaluate the condition of the concrete swimming pool with some measure of success and have a pretty good idea where this pool is in terms of like, good, okay, needs some work, total disaster like if you could just know that right off the bat that would help a lot because you could kind of zero in on the properties which have a pool which is a likely candidate to be a house you want to buy and then you hire the professionals and have them really get in there in person and look at this because they're going to see stuff that you can't see if you're not an experienced professional you're not going to be able to see all these problems but i'm really going to put a magnifying glass on the types of problems that can exist what to look for, all of that stuff. We're going through it systematically. This is probably going to be a long video. So when you look at this concrete pool, here's your mindset. You're like, I hope it's good. I like this house. I hope this pool's in good condition. Okay, stop right there. Back it up. Here's what we're going to do. Assume this thing is a piece of crap. It is as wrong as the day is long and it needs absolutely everything and all the problems are hidden. Okay, so now we're in the right mindset. Let's go take a look at this pool. Let's see if there's any redeeming qualities here. I have very low faith that uh, older concrete pools are going to be like, yeah, we're going to buy it. We're going to live in this house for 20 years and not really need to do much. Mm, unlikely. It's unlikely that the previous owners just did very expensive remediations to the pool and now they're selling more likely those remediations are coming due. You can't avoid them. They all have to kind of be done in conjunction with each other. So that's one of those little, you know, um, uh, traps that you get caught in with old concrete pools is you might only need like the tiles, but you got to do everything else to do the tiles. And now you're into way too much money, shocking amounts of money that you don't even want to hear about right now. So we go into this knowing that this thing's a piece of junk. 
it's not going to be any good but hey let's take a look okay so next we'll start with equipment plumbing deck coping tile interior surface those are all of the components of the pool i'll say that a little, little slower because it's pretty fast equipment so like you know pump filter heater the plumbing all the stuff under the deck that you should be very worried about if you're buying an old concrete pool the deck itself because decks are expensive to remove and replace a lot of heavy hard work the coping which on a concrete pool is the area of the pool of the of the pool deck which is directly on top of the pool wall itself so if you imagine walking up to the pool that you're going to go swimming in and you get ready to jump in and your toes are right over the edge of the pool your toes are or your whole body's on the coping and your toes are grabbing on the edge of the coping and why is there even this coping at all like that a lot of people ask that question i don't understand it's just the pool deck right it's not because the pool deck if you picture it, it's just like you know four inches of concrete that kind of just floats horizontally around in your in your yard but the pool's not it's like an eight foot tall concrete wall completely underground also it's filled with water and a bunch of other crazy stuff going on and that pool is going to move in your yard different than everything else uh we're, we're talking like expansion and contraction freeze and thaw uh just just settling over time you know all of that stuff will be different between basically everything else and the pool and so that's why we put a coping on top of the concrete pool wall because we need to isolate the pool from everything else and from a building perspective what that means is like you couldn't use grout or a hard surface to transfer we need some sort of elastic rubber or something to that degree that will allow for movement and it's that very fact that you need movement you need to have movement between the coping and the deck and interestingly you also need to have movement between the coping and the tile themselves because anytime that you're changing materials or you're changing planes of elevation you need to i don't think that's right planes of elevation if you're changing planes anyway you need to transfer with something that has the ability to have flexibility uh, because you're going to need to compensate for different rates of expansion and contraction between different materials and just the fact that that pool is not going to move like the rest of the yard so now you're picturing in your mind this whole thing is a little bit different when you break it down into the components we got the deck floating <laughs> in space over here we have the pool installed underground the coping is on top and here this is a very important point let me see if i'm at that point yet no, you know what? I'm going to save that point for a little bit more. I'm going to move on from the point that I was making there. And I'm going to proceed to talking about the equipment. I was kind of getting too much into that there. And I have a whole section that we need to cover on that in the future. Sorry that this video is going to be so long. But I mean, there's a lot to know here. And you really don't want to get screwed <laughs> buying the wrong concrete pool. And there's so many of them out there. It's crazy. Okay, so the equipment itself. Pump filter every pool has that you got to have it everything above that is a plus so just kind of remember that in terms of equipment what i want you to think about is longevity is about seven to ten years for the average pool equipment each piece of equipment you should be able to research and you should be able to find out the exact date of manufacture and now you can approximate how old this equipment is if it's you know anywhere from seven to ten years old it's reaching the end of its service life and anything you get now is going to be kind of a bonus if it's two to three years old you probably still have some life in this equipment regardless of what we're talking about pump filter or heater you know does stuff live 15 20 years in the world of pool equipment it's certainly used to <laughs> uh going back a couple generations it certainly did it doesn't really anymore typically speaking uh i find seven to ten years is kind of 12 to 15 years you have to have perfect water chemistry and uh, all sorts of factors working in your favor to get that kind of longevity out of uh, the average pool equipment being installed today uh, sorry if that hurts anybody's feelings but I, I think there's a lot of professionals that would agree with me the pump and the filter is fundamental you want them to be less than seven to ten years old 
You want the pump to be a variable speed variety. It would look newer. It's got like a control pad on it. You can control the RPM of the motor. It's more expensive. It's, uh, it indicates an investment into the efficiency of the system versus a older type system, which has a single speed pump, uh, might run on a mechanical timer commonly. Um, not as expensive, not as valuable. Same thing, seven to 10 years. Uh, of, of expected service life from that equipment. So the filter, diatomaceous earth, cartridge filter, or sand filter. Those are the three options in general. And depending on who you ask, you'll hear different information on which one is best. Cartridge filters in general are more expensive than sand filters by quite a bit, like maybe three times as much money. So if you discover the pretty big cartridge filter, so 300, 400, or 500 square feet cartridge filter, and it's like a couple years old, that's an expensive filter. Somebody's invested heavily into the system and they chose wisely, at least for me, they get my endorsement that that's a good filter. Um, moving on to the heater, 150 is kind of like the smallest uh, for an in-ground pool heater. And we're talking BTUs, 150. 250 is a really average number. You see a lot of 250 BTU heaters. 400 is kind of the maximum you'll see on the residential level. And so that allows you to gauge like how, how big expensive is this model of heater. And then again, you have to find out the age of the heater. So when I say find out the age, what I'm talking about is every piece of equipment here is going to have service plates and all sorts of stuff, which will contain all kinds of information like electrical information, model numbers from the manufacturer, certifications, inspections. If you take a look closely, you'll find a lot of information. Just take pictures of it with your phone and you're looking for model numbers, serial numbers. Brand, make, model. That's what we're looking for. Just, you know, like a car basically. And a lot of equipment will have serial codes on them. Um, and you could look up the exact date of manufacture for that equipment. So you've got whatever brand of equipment you have and you just find the model number and you just, you know, Google this. Google is your friend with this kind of stuff. You can find out an awful lot about your pool equipment with uh, some good Google foo. So I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, get pictures of all those, you know, numbers and service plates and all that. And you'll find out a ton of information about this equipment that you've got. You can look at you know, how much it costs, you know, to buy this kind of stuff and get a really good idea. Is this equipment new or old? And this matters a lot because you're, and you might just be thinking, well, whatever, let's get a new pump and filter, whatever. A modern mechanical installation, pump, filter, heater, salt chlorinator, modest automation, Jandy diverter valves, like the whole package, you could easily spend 10, 20, 30 plus thousand dollars on pool equipment systems now. So it matters a bunch, you know, the con you know, the condition of this one. Uh, in terms of the peripheral equipment, everything past the heater, you're going to have things like erosion feeders, which is a small canister, salt chlorinator cells, which is a tube that's installed, you know, right before the water goes back to the uh, pool. There's a couple of different things like that. Some larger items like AOP, some less common ones like germicidal UV or ozone systems. And all of these could cost anywhere from one, two, three thousand dollars, all the way up to five thousand plus dollars, depending on what peripheral equipment it is. So look into it, take pictures, brand, make, and model. And now you have a really good idea what's going on in this equipment room, how new everything is, you know, all that stuff. And of course, while you're in there, take a look for deficiencies. How does this room look overall? Does it look great? Like nice, clean, straight? Everything's plumb and square and using the same material or is the place just like a war room of, you know, different materials and leaks taped up with, you know, duct tape and stuff like that. You know, you can learn a lot just by inferring this stuff, looking at the general state of the pool, the general state of the pool equipment, that kind of stuff. So, and I highly recommend that you pay close attention to the details if you're thinking about buying a pool with an or at buying a house with an old concrete pool. Let's talk about the plumbing itself for a second. And you're like, well, what can I know? It's all underground. And you're right, you can't know a lot, but you wanna know everything you can. Here's a trick. Where the pipes come up from the ground, and then they go into the pump filter heater and all that, and then back into the ground to go to the pool. Do the pipes change material, like really quickly? Like they come out of the ground, a black pipe, and there's some like, 
hose clamps, but then it changes to white PVC that's like glued together. That would be really common actually. And what you would be looking at would be poly pipe, an older style of building. It's not completely antiquated anymore, but hardly anybody uses poly pipe anymore for building residential swimming pools. But you, you now have information. You know what this swimming pool was built with versus just what you're looking at there for the pump filter heater, which might have been changed, probably was changed at some point since this swimming pool was built. Because concrete swimming pools have a crazy long service life, 30, 50, 100 years. So yeah, you got to be careful with concrete swimming pools and try to pay attention to the details and see what you can learn. You know, maybe that poly pipe that we're talking about, maybe you notice there's a red stripe. I can see a red stripe on this black pipe. Like that's such a small detail. You wouldn't think to look for it, but man, that would be a great, great thing. If you saw a red stripe on there or a green stripe, even very uncommon for that, but both of those would be amazing. What am I even talking about? These pipes are pressure rated and that's what the stripe is indicating. And I would be more concerned when there's no stripe and super concerned when there's a white stripe because that means it's rated for drainage, non-pressure applications only. And so this little tidbit of information, like if you're looking at an old concrete pool and the pipes coming up out of the ground are some old ones and they've been changed to, you know, new stuff after that, but it is a black pipe and it does have a white stripe. Walk away, you are done here because this entire thing is leaking like crazy and all of it needs to be replaced. And unless that's something that sounds good to you and you're ready to do that, then just don't, just walk away because now you have better information to go by and you know that this pool was built with the wrong materials way back when and I don't want to hear about, oh, well, it's been going for 40 years. It's been wrong for 40 years, probably leaking the whole time. When we're talking about plumbing for a swimming pool, this is one of the most important things that I want you to do. I want you to go around the pool and I want you to observe in the pool deck for any signs that somebody's had to like cut a rectangle and dig down, make repairs or anything like that. And where I want you to pay closest attention are the return outlets. So the little orifices that shoot water back into the, the pool, usually a little circle, like four or five inches in diameter. Look above those, immediately above those. Has there been any, you know, squares dug up? Um, skimmer, same thing. Look to see if there's a big square around it where somebody's, you know, cut open the concrete and then and patched it at a future point. If there's steps, you know, around this thing, I want you to look at that. Anything like this is an indication that there's been leaks with the plumbing system. Somebody has performed a repair, but here's what I would assume. Let's say we're at this concrete pool. It does, it does have a square at one of the returns where somebody's dug down and they've made a repair, presumably. So what that tells me is, oh, okay, they all need to be fixed. Why does, why do I say that? Well, unless there's squares at all of them telling me that somebody fixed them all already, why did the one fail? Give me a logical reason why the one failed, but the other, let's say three of them did not, or two of them, this is an old pool. So the other two of them did not. To me, there's something wrong with the way they put it together or the way they backfilled, or the material they used, or something to this degree. And I would make the logical, reasonable, reasonable assumption that whatever the guy did who did this one, as soon as he finished that, he got up and he did the other one the exact same way. You just haven't experienced the failure yet. It's probably leaking a little or about to let go or something like that. But don't be a sucker. Let's assume that it's going to be a problem right off the bat. Squares cut out into the concrete deck are a really good indication for you about whether this pool has been, you know, had a bunch of surgery just to keep it going over time, or does it all look like, no, it all looks like old, but pretty original. I don't see anything here that didn't, that's a good sign. It's a great sign, in fact. I'll just throw this in here. I know we're in the plumbing section here, but do the lights work in this pool? Flick the switch on, take a look. Do the lights work? Turn it back off when you're done. Uh, that's just good information. You're going to want to know that. Lights leak a lot. Lights fail a lot. Lights are pretty expensive for modern swimming pools, more than you're probably expecting them to be. And I'm talking about ones that work, not old ones that are broken, haven't worked in years and are leaking and all kinds of problems. So, you know, what's the general condition of this light? That's a good indication. 
is there or is there not perhaps a problem here? The skimmers themselves, not everybody builds a pool the same way, but very commonly with a concrete pool, the skimmers are anchored to the shell itself with what we call skimmer boxes or just, you know, we form around the skimmers so that we can pour concrete all around them and include them in the steel grid and really just actually anchor them to the pool walls. So again, that it's not moving around. It's not part of the deck and floating around. It's like attached to the swimming pool and it moves with the swimming pool, which is good because otherwise you would almost certainly end up with a leak at the skimmer because even despite encasing it in concrete and, and steel and attaching it to the pool wall, the connection point between the skimmer and the pool itself still remains to be one of the most common places that concrete pools leak. So, I mean, you have to assume any problem with a concrete pool skimmer is going to be an expensive problem because don't look at it and go like, oh, this looks like I could kind of like pop it out, put a new one in there. You have to assume you have a three foot wide and deep cube of concrete encasing a tomb of concrete on all sides of that skimmer that you're going to have to break out. You're going to have to replace it as well. It's a ton of work. The plumbing is it's difficult to plumb it properly. It's not impossible, but it's it's just a challenging thing. And the connection point between the skimmer and the pool wall itself is funny. On some pools, you could mess up the tiles doing a repair like this, and now you're into tile work and other stuff. And so it's kind of one of these jobs, if you could avoid it, that would be best. And so really scrutinize these skimmers for cracks. Hands and knees, big flashlights, really looking at, is are you, are you sure there's no cracks in that skimmer? All the way down on the bottom, all the way around the sides, in the throat itself, at the bottom of the throat where the, where it, here's one, tap on the bottom of the throat. Does that sound hollow? Cause it shouldn't. They often do from poor installation. They often do from water erosion, wearing away that material over time. But in either case, if you tap on the bottom and it sounds hard like you're tapping on a sidewalk that's a great sign and i bet you that this one that you're tapping on doesn't sound like that because it probably leaks or probably has had water you know erosion or it was not installed properly where you really consolidate the material well to get it all the way up underneath there that is a big leak point in concrete pools let's talk about the deck itself for a second so again the coping is the area directly over the pool wall but everything else how does it look? If there are big cracks, big elevation gaps in those cracks, sloping, like it, like it's sinking or falling away, any of that stuff immediately around the swimming pool to me, when I see that, I assume the pool is leaking. Somebody else, different contractor might give you a different answer, but I'm, I'm a concrete pool guy, and especially on an old concrete pool, boy, that's a that's a lot of sinking and moving concrete here, you know, and then I'd look as, okay, so there's a return right here in the pool. And right here, this is like big crack, and then that section is sinking over there. That, to me, would be hallmark for a cracked return in a pool. What happens is, I'll just explain it quickly, if you plumb it incorrectly when you're building a swimming pool, you got a wall of a pool and you plumb a pipe into it. But the problem is you just did it wrong and that's probably going to leak and that's probably what happened here. You have the wall of the pool and you have to immediately 90 down with your pipe and then you can 90 off in the direction that you want your pipe run to go. When you go straight out, you create a leverage point and over time the ground's going to settle and when it does, the pipe's going to shear off at the pool wall. I see it all the time even modern pools i see guys putting them in with a straight pipe just shooting off yonder and you're thinking over time that's not going to settle like you're creating a hinge here and for sure you're going to shear that return off probably one of the number one leak sources for swimming pools across the board including old concrete ones so that deck material i want it to look good i don't want any sinking sloping cracking nothing like that the more of that I see, the more concerned I am that there's a problem with the plumbing with this concrete pool that's causing damage over time. And long-term erosion is terrible. You can you could have such a can of worms waiting for you when, once. It's not just like, ah, oh, we'll just, how much is a new concrete? Couple thousand, no problem. It's like, you could be digging up decades worth of problems here. So you have to be acutely aware of that and very conservative when you take risks. 
uh, in terms of making assumptions of what you're going to find and how small your, your renovation is going to be and stuff like Concrete pools can punish you mercilessly in terms of unexpected costs and things like that to the tune of an extra fifty or extra $100,000 that you weren't ready for. The coping itself, we're ready to talk about. There's stone coping, there's cast coping, there's pour in place, there's all kinds of different ways that you can have a coping. Red bricks are popular for a while. All of them need to have the same thing. They all need to be isolated from the pool deck. There needs to be an elastic membrane that separates it, the coping, by about half an inch from the remainder of the swimming pool deck. This accounts for the expansion and contraction of the pool deck. You would be surprised to know that like 100 linear feet of concrete across a 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature spread will expand by almost three quarters of an inch horizontally. And if you chew on that for a second, you realize like, oh, that's actually quite a lot. Like if you had a big pool deck, you know, between your house and the edge of the pool and the difference between the coldest winter temperature and the hottest summer temperature. Yeah, no, okay, that's a lot of expansion. And I live up north and we deal with freeze and thaw up here. And we know that when water freezes and expands, it destroys everything. There's nothing stronger than that. And it's the same thing here. When your concrete pool deck expands, it is going to push on your swimming pool and it is going to shatter it. If you do not maintain that, that isolation barrier between your coping and your pool deck, it's one of the most thing. It's the thing I want you to be the most careful of because it's so easy to see, right? It's right there. Is, is that thing failing or is it not there at all? I'll mention you can have a situation where you have a pool deck which includes the, the coping, like it's all just uniform, all just looks like a pool deck, there's no isolation of anything, it's just a pool deck. Yes, you can have that, there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. You have to use a bond breaker on top of the pool wall and make sure that the deck is completely isolated from the remainder of the pool wall. It just kind of slides around on top of the pool wall, it is not tied in in any way. If it is tied into the pool wall, there's a very high chance that you're going to deal with expansion issues and it's going to push on the, the walls and you're going to experience something called a bond beam failure, a bond beam fracture. And the telltale sign for this are long horizontal cracks that run like the length of the wall, 12, 18 inches, 24 inches down from the top of the pool. It's the number one thing I want you to look at when you're out there. I don't know how many times I've said that. They're all number one things I want you to look at. Go and look at the concrete pool. Look for cracks that run horizontally and that are, you know, some distance down from the top, 12 inches, 24 inches, something like that. If you see that, we're done here. Go grab an early lunch because you're not buying this pool. Uh, uh, the bond beam failure is a structural failure and it that pool's done. Like that pool is shot. It needs the entire top half of it could be not attached to the bottom half of it anymore. You have to respect that power of expanding materials. And that's why that expansion gap is so important. You have to isolate the coping from it. So now you know a little bit about that coping, how it relates to the pool deck, how dangerous that can be, how much damage it can cause. And let's now talk about where that pool coping meets the tile. This is very important. Where the, the coping meets the tile should be an elastic joint, like a concrete urethane or something like that. I see a lot of people use silicone, it's not the right thing. But you know what I see most of all is grout. The, the tile guy who's doing the, you know, the grouting, he'll do that top joint too. And it will always break, crumble, and fall out over and over and over again. And sometimes it can transfer those forces down into your top tiles and it can start to crack them, make some of your tiles pop off. And that sucks because tiles are super expensive and you don't want that to happen. So that is an important thing that I want you to look at. And I can all but guarantee you're going to see what you shouldn't see, which is grout making that connection joint. But remember when I said earlier, if you're changing planes, you have to do it with an elastic joint. You've got a hard surface and a hard surface you have to seam them together with something that can move or you're going to get movement and whatever you use is going to crack and fail. See it all the time. Not a huge deal in and of itself, but how has it affected the tiles? 
are the tiles all busted up now? You need new tiles? Because if you're thinking to yourself, like, oh, yeah, these tiles don't look good. It's probably going to need, like, new new tiles there. I, I did tiles on my backsplash. What's that going to be, like, eight, $800 or something? It's, like, it's going to be $20,000 to retile your pool. And you would be lucky to get away with only doing that because probably it's going to need to have coping work or interior surface work done as well. You could end up doubling or tripling that number pretty easily. So, yeah. A row of missing tiles is a huge deal. It is not just a small amount of tiles you have to put back on. It is an indication of a symptomatic problem here. Something that's gone wrong could be anything from a structural fail failure to deck shear to anything. But it's very unlikely you're going to fix it by sticking those tiles back on. Most likely the actual fix to the thing is to renovate the whole thing and do it properly. Because uh, honestly, there's there's got to be more poorly built concrete pools than there are well-built concrete pools. And again, you know, I, I don't want to say bad stuff about the industry because then people will just not buy concrete pools. But this is the truth. And especially when you're talking about old ones that you're just walking into sight unseen. I don't know. It looked pretty good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Moving on. The tile. Does the tile look perfect or does it look not perfect? Because those are kind of like my two things. And it's if you're like, no, it's it's perfect. It looks old, it looks dated, stuff like that. But no, it's they're all there. It's not missing any. It looks good. Like we'd like to update them or something. Talk about that at a later time. The best case scenario are 50-year-old tiles, which are still there, haven't moved, nothing's wrong with them. They look fine, actually. It can be that's the case. And that to me is like, yeah, it's a well-built pool. It's a well-built pool you've got there. And if those tiles made it 50 years and they still look good, just dated. Well, you can probably get another five to ten years out of them, maybe more, right? So let's let's explore that. That's a good sign to me. What I don't want to see is missing tiles, repairs, cracks, anything like that. Cracks are hard to find. Look for efflorescence. Efflorescence is it's like a scale growth, right? It's a crystalline like salt. Picture like salt crystals growing, something like that. But you'll see like a very faint line of them on the tile and if you get right in there with your fingernail you might just notice they're growing along a crack which exists if it's through one tile like a big format tile large format tile that's not a good sign but if it's going through like two by two tiles and it's going through a bunch of them there has been a force applied that has broken tiles which are hard as heck and it's transferred through all of them i would be very worried could there be a structural crack of some kind under that location? When I see efflorescent lines in tiles, that's a concern to me. When I see it, you know, from the top, kind of like melting down over the tiles, it's, that's a different thing. That's more traveling through the mortar, mortar bed that the coping's probably mounted on. It's when I see a line of that efflorescence traveling through the tiles itself, or for that matter, down the interior surface of the swimming pool. Have you found like a little line of efflorescence kind of just snaking its way down the wall of the swimming pool? There is very likely to be a crack existing under that. Grab your magnifying glass and go take a look. Interior surfaces in concrete swimming pools. Ugh, what a complicated subject to try to consolidate into a, a short period of time. But there is, there's tile. You could have entirely tile. That's the Cadillac. Again, Look at the previous section. Is it all perfect, etc.? Uh, shouldn't be missing any, anything like that. It has the longest potential service life. If it's new tiles, I'm, I'm. There's a lot of stuff you gotta look at. If it's a really old pool and it's been like this forever, this, this could be a really good pool that you're looking at. But let's assume that it's not that because this is a vast minority. The majority of pools are going to be plaster or pebble interior surface. This is a hand applied cementitious product which has a different reveal or render on the surface one is a hard trowel one is an exposed aggregate but ultimately they're the same thing they're providing a thin dense layer between the water and the substrate concrete shell it's supposed to look nice it's supposed to feel nice um it's supposed to be fairly resistant to like porosity and water resistance it is not it is not waterproof. If you only had a concrete shell and plaster or concrete shell and pebble, that's not waterproof. It's highly water resistant. It is an important distinction because there is something that, that is, uh, you know, waterproof. You can put 
waterproofing on a concrete pool and make it actually waterproof. Like if you put a concrete pool on the roof of a hotel, it has to be totally waterproof, not 99% waterproof. So there's a difference between highly water resistant and waterproof. And when it comes to old concrete pools, none of them are waterproof. They're all at best highly water resistant. When it comes to the interior surface, this is relevant because we're talking about a large surface area and the rougher it is to the touch, the more likely it is that that concrete is porous, readily leaching water, probably causing further damage. You probably need to sandblast that interior surface and spend 10 or $20,000 getting a new plaster or something like that. And, you know, if it's already smooth, it looks really good. It's not really any staining or anything like that. I like the sounds of that. If it's rough, if it's missing pieces, all that, like basically already, already we're talking, you probably need a new interior surface. And it's not just that you need one, you have a problem with that one, it's got to go or be remediated or, you know, determine how extensive the delaminations are or something has to happen to it, but you'll be spending money one way or another. And that's not really do it yourself friendly work. Like don't grab yourself a can of paint from the hardware store and be like, I'm going to fix this. No, you're probably going to ruin the pool is what you're going to do. Most concrete pool specialists say you should never paint a concrete pool. And I tend to agree. I sympathize with the community that paints them because I live in the epicenter of the area of people who paint concrete pools. And it's simply because with freeze and thaw, plaster does not last. It looks like crap and it fails so fast. And pebble does a little better, but not much better. And, you know, tile is just too expensive. And there's not a lot of specialists for concrete pools where I live. And as a result, people are just forced to deal with it on their own. So they paint their pools for better or worse. I encourage you not to look to see if this pool is painted, you know, with a very close eye, is this pool painted? It's hard to tell on a concrete surface, but we're talking about like white plaster, which is essentially like a white sidewalk versus something that like, no, no, I can, with my thumbnail, I can see this has got like some sort of paint or coating on it like that. Lower quality, higher likelihood for failure, more do it yourself friendly, but it's still not cheap. Like I'm, I'm well into the plaster category. If you see problems, delamination, stuff like that, you're probably going to need to spend money and you're probably going to need to replaster this pool. And again, sometimes this stuff is connected and you have to do it all at once. Like that's how you can get into trouble with this. So are there any cracks in the pool? Any cracks at all? If there's cracks, you're done, go home early lunch. If there's you can't fix it. There's things you can do. There's people that will say, oh, I can fix that for you. There are remediations that you can do with injectable urethanes and uh, hyd uh, hydraulic concrete and all these different things. You can pin it with rebar staples and all this stuff. And at best, they slightly improve the situation. But if the pool wants to keep moving, because clearly something's wrong with it because it cracked, it's going to move and nothing you do is going to stop it short of tearing it out and putting a new pool in its place. So at this, from this perspective, you you don't buy houses with cracked concrete pools, period. I don't care what they said they did to it to fix it or how long they've been using it. And it's fine. It's not fine. Move on to the next house. Bond beam shear. We talked about that earlier. Failing interior surfaces, deck crack leaks. Is the pool level? The water level doesn't lie. So you can easily tell by looking, is this pool level is it sinking? I would be highly disinclined to buy a sinking concrete pool, even if they say it's been sinking like that for 50 years and it hasn't moved. I don't know, man. Is that, does this person look like the most trustworthy person you've ever met in your life? Maybe believe them. I don't know. For me, sinking concrete pool, something's wrong. You don't have to own this problem. Just walk away and buy a pool without a sinking problem. To me, that's the thing to do. So I've reached the end of my list. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, please feel free to ask questions and stuff in, in the comments. I'll do what I can. Maybe we can deep dive on some of these subjects because I could talk about each and every one of these subjects in greater detail because we basically didn't even talk about how much stuff really costs, what to do, all that. All we did is just identify where are the red flags with co old concrete pools. I hope you found this information helpful. If you did, please like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you can check out my website, swimmingpoolsteve.com.